Hello, Maverick fans. Welcome to another edition of the Mav Puck Cast. As always, thank you for listening. I am Jason. And I am John. We're back with our daily episode of the Mav Puck Cast. <laughs> if you weren't tired of us before, you're probably tired of us now. Yeah, I'm thinking we're going to have 10 episodes of this podcast at the end of the NCHC pod hockey uh, format here. That's a that's a lot. That's like almost half a season for us right here yeah, in a three week time frame. That would put us at like 13 or 14 episodes on the season, I think. Yeah. Yeah, because we'll I have... wonder, we'd well, have to go back and look and say, by the end of December, how many podcast episodes have we done the past two seasons? So so that's the thing. We did, what, two or three before the season started, and then we'll have 10 after this, so that'll be 13. And then the second half of the season, we will have, and the games, the games are a little bit different. There's a couple of three-game series, so I'm not quite sure how those 16 games will hash out as far as podcast schedules go, but but I think you could be right that it'll be, what, maybe half of that uh, 16 games, so about 18, maybe 16, 18, like you said. Yeah, probably somewhere in there when we're all said and done. The bulk of it will probably just be <laughs> these next couple weeks. So. Yeah, yeah, we'll... Uh... <laughs> We'll see what happens. So a heck of a game the other night, which we talked about in the last podcast, and then here on a late Sunday evening, we head to the uh, visitor's bench to play St. Cloud, who came into the game undefeated at Baxter Arena. And yes, unfortunately they did. leave the game undefeated at Baxter Arena. Yeah, they're they have not lost a game at Baxter Arena since Baxter Arena opened in October of 2015. We gotta fix that. I think we got another game against them in the pod. So hopefully Hopefully we're the I would like to be the team that beat them, I mean at least, so that they're not completely, you know, arrogant when they come in here, but yeah, I'm I'm with you on that, and uh, and early on, it looked like we had a chance to make that happen tonight. Yeah, that first period was really good. The guys were moving their legs, and uh, I know Julie and I were talking and stuff like that's what I kind of expected with St. Cloud playing Denver last night. Um, I mean, that's a tough team to play. They got a win. They played really, really good, but it's a short turnaround, you know. College kids are used to back to backs, but this whole pod format's kind of just a it's a completely different beast. And I think that UNO's speed has caught some teams off guard. And it looked in the first period like St. Cloud was falling into that trap of it's Omaha will be fine. And I was kind of optimistic that maybe our predictions from last week were going to come true. Yeah, I was hoping it would come true, and I we had a very, very good opportunity. And obviously, like we've talked about, a lot of people have marveled at UNO's speed early on in this pod hockey structure. Um, and it'd be interesting to know, just, just I was thinking about this today when I was out on my walk. I thought, you know, I, I'm assuming... Yeah, and you know about this because obviously you work, uh, you work for an organization that uh, helps... Uh, students find college scholarships and financial aid money to uh, to be able to further their education and uh, at colleges and universities around the country. And I, I wondered, are most of these schools then after Thanksgiving, are most of them off? Are classes done until after the first of the year because of the pandemic? Hard to say without looking at what the academic calendars are for each of the schools. I know there are a number of schools that have taken a very long break. Uh, I think the university systems here had gone to online only. Uh, A lot of the classes, at least, if not all of them, had gone to online only for that week post uh, Thanksgiving here. And then it's finals weeks after that, and then they're off. Um, and I know some of them have talked about pushing winter break an extra week. 
uh, just to give some more time between Christmas and when school starts, hoping that, you know, the possibility of exposure to COVID uh, over the holiday, the Christmas holiday specifically would be kind of washed out. So, right. Uh, and and I didn't mean to, you know, throw a little wrench in our discussion. I just I had wondered if, you know, the combination of starting the season a bit later and maybe not having to deal with, you know, going to classes in between series and all that stuff was really helping UNO as a team focus because I think that they've looked like a really focused, you know, well-oiled machine. And early on in the season, they haven't for the past couple seasons, they haven't always done that. Obviously the team's more mature. A lot of the young players that we've had the last two seasons have improved uh, over the course of uh, uh, their college hockey careers. So you know, it was just one of those things that popped into my head. I thought because this is in such close proximity and they're just focused on hockey, 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 I wondered if that had helped the team kind of develop. Now, I say that and then there, there are teams like, you know, DU that are 0-3 so far. But I didn't mean to uh, derail our conversation at all. I just that was something that popped into my head because they look honestly really focused. Now, tonight, like we said, that first period, first goal from Matt Miller, who's Great newcomer for the team was a, a a beautiful goal, exciting at that point. I was excited. I know you guys were excited. UNO was looking good, and they were looking like they were gonna gonna be able to roll with St. Cloud for uh, sixty minutes tonight. Yeah, a couple minutes later, St. Cloud evens it up, and even at that point in time, I thought that UNO still had. A bit of the upper hand, I, you know, these two teams that seemed very, very close to each other. I don't I don't think, you know, anyone was running away with it. No, but it seemed like UNO was using their speed better uh, and, and catching St. Cloud, like I said, off guard just a little bit. Um, and then it was just a couple minutes after the even score that uh, Brock Bremer on a really nice feed from Weiss puts UNO up again and we finish the first period in the locker room with a 2-1 lead against an undefeated uh, St. Cloud team. Oh yeah, it was great. First uh, collegiate goal for Brock Bremer, a, a player that you and I got to watch in person back in uh, December of 2018. A guy that we were uh, waiting with bated breath to see him play at UNO. The short guy, five foot five inches tall, but I I got to be honest with you. I was really excited to see him uh, get that goal. Uh, uh, and I'm, it's late at night, and I'm thinking off the top of my head. I believe he fired that in from the circle. It was a, a great shot, great goal. And you're right. After that first period, being up two to one, I was feeling confident myself. Especially after yet another five minute penalty there towards the end that UNO had to to kill off and. Uh, I mean, any youth hockey player out there in the Omaha area area that that wants to kind of see what you're supposed to do on a on a penalty kill, like I'd take those five minutes and just play it on repeat. That was that was again a, a stellar job from UNO's penalty kill. Um, they were quick on the pucks. They challenged. They didn't give a lot of time and space. Um, smart sticks in lanes and good clears. In... Yeah, the PK the PK unit played really, really well on that. And I think they allowed, what, one or two shots that entire five-minute stretch, which was fantastic. Yeah, and casual fans that don't know, five-minute major power plays like that are score as much as you like. Yep. So it's very, very important that you have a sound penalty kill at that point in time because... I mean, at that, we were up by one. It, you easily could have had us going in down by one or two sometimes. I've seen teams score four or five goals on a five-minute power play. Yeah, especially against a team like St. Cloud. You know, they're, they're, they're a fast, fast-moving team that cycles the puck well, and you just didn't know. So I, you got to give props to the defensive unit on UNO because they looked really good. And, and like I said, I was feeling really, really good going into that inner, that first intermission. And I was excited to see what would happen in the second period. Which unfortunately now we're back to being kind of the Mavs of old. And we, for some reason have, we struggle in second periods and I've never understood why the second period seems to always be our struggle. But, uh, 
it was again i thought we were kind of a little flat um I don't know. I don't know what happened in the locker room, but it just seemed a little bit like a different team coming out into the second period. I felt, and about midway through is when, you know, it starts to hurt us. Uh, I think it's nine minute mark that Saint Cloud evens it at two, and then like a minute later, you've got Saint Cloud up by one. Right, and that at that point, you know, it's one of those things in games and. And uh, I'll just ask you about this. It's it's one of those things. It, there's a there's a psychological thing that seems to happen when a when your your opponent is able to hold that one goal lead for an extended period of time in a game. Uh, it, it's only a one goal lead, as you said, in any you know kind of funky bounce and and you know ricochet rebound can you know help you get the equalizer. But it always seems like the longer that that one lead that one goal lead is held by a team the harder and harder it becomes for a team to uh to to get the opportunities to put the puck on net you know what i'm saying uh yeah i could see that i think for me it's always and i don't know if it's just you know the old coaching mentality and stuff but it's kind of reading the room a little bit and seeing you know what your what your team is uh i had a team in the past that this kind of situation where you're ahead and then it's a swing and now you're behind um they try they get into this mindset of trying to do too much uh you know, when you have that swing where you've been in the lead for so long, you kind of sat in back, you haven't had, you know, great opportunities to kind of capitalize on. Uh, and then all of a sudden you're behind and you're trying to manufacture offense. Uh, the teams can kind of get a little bit fancy and they fail to do the basic things, get pucks to net, get the guys to net, sticks and lanes, um, finding time and space. Uh, they kind of just all crash and dive. And so... I I don't know. I mean, you and O I thought bounced back well. Uh, Taylor Ward gets a goal, um, not too long, but like a couple minutes after St. Cloud goes up to even the score, you know. And I think that was a that was a good push by you and O to say, you know, we're not just going to sit back. We can do this. We can hang with these guys. Um, and it was it was that kind of grind goal that you need from them. It, you know, it's not the kind of goal we're used to seeing Taylor Ward score, you know, top of the circle snipe off a post or something. Like yeah. That. Or it's not some pretty tic-tac-toe type of goal. Right. You know, no, but, uh, but those are the kind of goals you need in a game. The thing that worried me was the, the goals by St. Cloud in the second period, uh, I felt were really just poor rebound management by Seville. And I mean, as a goaltender, sometimes there's nothing you can do about it, uh, but I'm sure he will probably want them back, and he'll probably be harder on himself than we ever will be on him. But that that was the part that kind of deflated me was those two goals just kind of really felt like they just weren't well managed. He made the good first save, but he didn't put the puck in a place where you know, that it wasn't at risk. Both of those were pucks that came into the middle. Uh, the second one was just kind of a fluky bounce. It, it, he takes it off the leg pad. It goes off of a couple of skates and shin pads and it's in your net. And that, that can really get to you that mindset of like, we're with them, we're battling, but then we're just not going to get the puck luck. Right. You're exactly right. And, and that was, you know, that, that's something we've seen from UNO goaltenders over the years, there have been uh, there have been netminders who've had a penchant for giving up some of those you know big juicy rebounds and uh, and teams uh, in the past have taken advantage of that and to be sure Saint Cloud did during the second period tonight and that's always tough there's there's not a lot you can do about that um, and it you know it, it does bring into question obviously Isaiah Seville is is our best goaltender and one of the best goaltenders in the conference. But we talked about this compressed format for games. And you look at a, a team like St. Cloud, which has a, a very capable, very experienced goaltender in David Rennick, who has logged a lot of playing time for them over the last few seasons. And you did, you did wonder if at some point UNO was going to 
switch up the goaltender, try a different uh, try a different guy in net and see what happened. Obviously, you don't want to mess with the dynamic that you had in the first three games of this pod format. But I, I wondered what you thought about trying out a, a you know an Austin Roden tonight. Obviously, St. Cloud's a very very good team and has shown a lot of firepower in this uh, uh, in this. Uh, uh, game schedule so far and I, I don't know what you thought about maybe mixing it up trying it Mike Gabinette doesn't seem like a guy who does that but I wonder what your thoughts with the games in such close proximity yeah I could make an argument both ways so it's hard to kind of second guess him you know he obviously has more information than we do but I will say that his decision for tonight's game was made before the Miami game like if he was really serious about splitting time uh, and giving Seville a break, Seville's break should have been Saturday night, Saturday the, afternoon. That would have been the team that you do it against. Yeah, I'd put Roden in against Miami, give give Seville that extra extra day rest, uh, and put Seville in against you know St. Cloud and and most of that's just because I think that while both goalies are capable, you, you, there is a mindset aspect to the net. And I just didn't see a reason if you worrying about injuries and stuff long-term in this format, where we're going so many games, you know, in such a short time frame, um, you've got to kind of use your backups when you can just to minimize the risk of injury to your top goaltender. Right, which we saw with uh, Western Michigan. Yeah, this last week. I mean that yeah. that that team is 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 an entirely different team with their top goaltender as we saw when UNO played them, and you know they're they're in a rough spot because he's gone for the pod, and probably from what I'm hearing, the start of the quote unquote second half of the season, uh, right? He may not be ready until February. It sounds like. Uh, depending on how the injury progresses and, and kind of what happens. So, you know, that team's kind of having, in this format, having to figure out how do we tighten up, where's the right places to take a risk, you know, and coming together and gelling as a unit. And I just don't want to see UNO have to go through that. And part of that comes from, you know, them deciding when and where it's a good time to rest the players, any of the players, because you could go up and down the lineup and say, we've got talented guys that have not broken the lineup right now, uh, both forwards and defenders. So when do you say, hey, let's give, you know, so-and-so player, you know, a night off because four games in five days is just a lot to do. Right. And I mean, maybe, maybe you don't this season, obviously they're going to play fewer games, assuming they get all the games in, uh, you know, after the, after January rolls around. So maybe you, maybe you ride Isaiah Seville the entire season. I just, I just had wondered if, if that would be something that would be good for the coaches to do. We've, we've debated that on this podcast time and time again, especially in a compressed format like this. You know, some teams are doing it. Some teams aren't doing it. You know, it's just uh, it's an interesting thing. I mean, I you know, part of that's player mentality, and that's why I say like I can't second guess coach on this because he's got more information than me. I mean, I can I can give you reasons why you wouldn't, reasons why you wouldn't, right? Right. But ultimately, what it comes down to is Gabnet knows Seville and his mindset better than any of us, and. You know, Seville, for all I know, maybe the guy that says, that's my net, and if you want it, you have to pry it from my cold, dead hands, right? Like, right. If right. I'm not hurt, it's my net. Don't give it to anyone else. And that's, like, I remember, I remember NHL goaltenders that were that way, that were just like, if I don't tell you it's okay, you don't pull me. Patrick Wall was that way. Like if, if Wa says it's okay, I want a break, take me out, then it's fine. But I don't care what the score is. If Patrick Wa didn't want to come out, you didn't pull Patrick Wa. Like Montreal learned their lesson. Um, <laughs> he drove the show and 
you know, I don't know Seville well enough to know whether or not that's his mindset or not. No, we just don't. We don't have any idea uh, one way right. or another. So after Ward's goal, I'm thinking, you know, this is all right. We'll go into the third um, evened up. It's a game of 20 minutes. I, w- I was kind of feeling good there. And then again, another kind of welcome to the world of UNO. We let in a late period goal and we end up going into the locker room trailing four to three. Um yeah, and you give up kind of a broken play thing again. And sure, and you give up four goals. It's going to be hard to win, regardless of the circumstances. And I think that that's what we saw going into the third period. Awfully, awfully tough for them. Uh, they had a few opportunities. Um, ultimately, though, the St. Cloud goaltender played well in that third period, and I thought overall their team played well in that third period. You know, we were outshot i believe each of the three periods uh although it was relatively close um and overall i think we out we ended up out shooting saint cloud uh, we did have opportunities there were there were a few down there that i thought maybe we could get if we could have just gotten an equalizer it would have been great but ultimately that didn't happen Nope. Um, you know, we're in it. I think that's, you take away from this and the Duluth game, both of our losses here, you say, you know what, we're, we're not out of it, right? A goal here right. was all we really needed, you know, one less um, puck bounce in our direction. And, you know, we're, we're right there. We've got a chance. So the guys should feel good about themselves, about being competitive with top teams in the nation. Uh And in the conference and to look at this and say, we are not a, you know, fighting to be the best of the last, like we have the last few seasons. This isn't a, you know, is it going to be you, Miami or Colorado college at the bottom of the league? This is exactly right. Yeah. If you want it, it's there for the taking. You guys have enough talent. Uh, You have good coaching. You have, you know, every element that you need to be successful, the question is, are you going to have the mindset that you need to be that successful? Well, and furthermore, it's still early on. And if you look at a lot of the production that's happened on this team, it's with the newcomers. It's with those freshmen uh, and and uh, and transfer players this year. And that's that's been really exciting to see. So I think there'll be good things that happen as – as things uh, uh, evolve down the stretch. So like you, I'm so, not worried about that at all either. But I, I like I said, I was, I was excited to, you know, I'm excited to see the newcomers being productive and having success early on because I think that's really important. And I think that that gives the coaching staff and, and the entire lineup uh, and the entire roster a lot of hope. Do you think there's a reason for that production coming so much from new players, fresh faces? I it, it it kind of surprises me a little bit. I thought there might be, you know, maybe one guy who really kind of would stand out from this this class coming in, and it's it's been very interesting to see. You know, you've, Matt Miller has scored multiple goals. Brock Bremer gets his first goal. We've seen Jimmy Glenn has looked good so far. It it's been kind of a surprise to see some of those newcomers do as well as they have because some of these guys it's not like they were necessarily lighting up you know their junior leagues lighting up the ushl but they've come in and they've really fit in well and martin sunberg said something when the when the dave starman and ben holden interviewed him uh between periods when he said that the team chemistry was really good this year and that's something you've talked about on the podcast over the past couple seasons is the team just didn't, especially two seasons ago, they didn't look like they had a lot of chemistry at all. And so far this season, the team looks like they had a lot of chemistry. And I don't know if that's a, you know, a factor of, you know, Gabinet finally getting the guys who truly buy into what he's doing and came here to play for him, as opposed to being players who had come to play for another coach and, and, you know, were adapting to a, a new coaching staff you know, I, I can't put my finger on it. And, uh, you know, I don't know. Do you have any ideas on that? Or do you have any thoughts? I, I'm i not so sure it's so much 
a, a difference or change in UNO as much as it is, especially in this format, it's really easy that these teams can kind of key up on the guys that came from last year and what they can do. And you look at like our top line is pretty much together, right? Conley, Abate, um, and Ward. And the three of them you knew from last year were going to be productive. And so when you're, you know, I think today against St. Cloud, it, it was very evident to me that they knew shut down that line and then play away. Like try to try to get get what you can when those guys aren't on the ice, right? But they kind of keyed into that. And I think that over time, these teams are going to start to learn and adapt to, okay, how much can we spread defense and what of our players as St. Cloud uh, match up well against what lines for and what forwards or what defense pairings and things like that. That that chess game that happens with coaches and line changes and things I think is going to become you know, more evident as the pod goes on and as the season goes on. And so the question will be, can they be this successful later on? That, that, yeah, exactly. You're exactly right. And that's a great point is how much of this is the element of surprise because the other teams have not seen this lineup. You look at, you look at our top line. When you look at the line chart, it's really, really interesting to me that Coach Gabinette has had Randall's, uh, Randall Sullivan and Sunberg as the top line, and then that Conley, Abate, and Ward is the number two line, and those guys were the line last season. They were the players on the team. And I don't know if that the, the desire there is to you get those. You know, obviously, that top line, the, the Randall, Sullivan, Sunberg line, has been productive. But then we also have seen you know, Weiss, Glenn, and Bremer have success too. So... As well as the fourth line when you've got Brochette, Primo, and Miller. Um, but you're right. That, that's the question. Will the teams be able to adapt to them over time? Not not just not just these next couple of weeks, but you know, in January and February. It's a good point. Well, and that's where Gabnet talked about it, you know, before at, at some of the season ticket holder events and and media things and stuff that I've seen him do. You know, he talked about balanced offense, you know, that up and down the line. And I've every team's looking for this, right? You you need production from every level so that teams can't just come in and kind of queue up on one line. And that's been something that they've been able to do against UNO in the past. Right. So it'll be I, I, I fully expect that the caliber and the talent level and then the competitiveness that the new players are going to get from these teams is going to increase over time and it's just a question of who rises to the top because if if we let's say st cloud again in in the next game against them you know if they let up on a, a defensive pairing against uh the ward line and you know, put a stronger line out against or a faster line or something different, you know, maybe a more physical line against Weiss's line to try to shut them down, uh, thinking that, you know, two freshmen and, you know, a talented forward who's considered, you know, slightly undersized, um, you know, that you can push them around or something a little bit, right? Like, if right. that happens, we yeah. either need them to say it doesn't matter and they're still going to be productive or you need your top line now, your ward line to say you can't do that because we're just going to snipe you all night long. Um, and that's that chess game. Like the players have to get out there and say, create, we're going to create opportunities uh, regardless of who we're up against. And if they have that mindset, I think they can be competitive against any team that's out there. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, you know, they're, they're playing really well on both sides of the ice right now. And I think, I don't know, like, like Martin Sundberg said, I think that the team seems to have really good chemistry right now. And, um, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's just they look like they've, they've got some depth. Uh, it's not going to be perfect, like as, as we saw saw tonight and we saw in the, the first game against Duluth. Things aren't always going to go their way. And, and they're going to get some tough games from some teams we're not expecting. You know, watching uh, Miami play today, they're looking better as this thing uh, wears on. And 
You know, we haven't seen and Colorado no one knows College what we're yet. Get from College, yeah. Have no idea what we're going to get from Colorado College. They they may they may be the surprise of the tournament when they uh, when they make their debut this week. And they are UNO's next matchup. They will play Tuesday, and then UNO plays them on Wednesday evening. Um, so they get a they get a trial by fire here on Tuesday, having to play, and then you know we'll get them. So it'll be interesting to see what they look like uh, having more time away from the pod because of their uh, COVID case and then having to just kind of jump in right off the bat and then go back to back. Yeah. I mean, the, the question is, will there will there be a lot of rust because they haven't played um, played a, a competitive game yet or will they be fresher because they haven't played a game yet. You know, <laughs> you just don't know at this point. So it'll be really interesting to see what happens this Wednesday. Well, I think it's time um, to do player of the game, right? Yes. It's that, it's that time again. Let's do our player of the game and I'll go first this time. I think I, I uh, had you go first last time. I'm, uh, I'm going to kind of continue my tradition of, uh, awarding a player that gets their first goal of the season and the first goal of their career. So I'm going to go with Brock Bremer player. I was excited to see play at UNO had the second goal for UNO tonight. A uh, very exciting goal. And uh, he's a player that's, he's really looked good through these first four games in the pod. So I uh, got to give props to the freshman. Brock Bremer is my player of the game. Yeah, I, I liked his play. I think the biggest thing is we've talked about it last year. You know, Weiss is best when he has someone on the line that he can feed the puck to uh, and isn't afraid to shoot, right? Like right. Weiss is, is that perennial setup artist. And, yep. and he's got probably, probably the best hands on the team, the best puck possession um, hands and, and skill sets. So I think that, you know, Bremer's been in feeding from Weiss's eyes and, and vision, and he's got some really good talent. And that's, that's a pairing in our, in one of our earlier episodes, I said, I'm really uh, intrigued to see kind of how the two of those go. Cause I could see it being, you know, really productive. Yeah. You were excited about that potential lineup and so yeah. far so good. Yeah. And you know, I didn't, I didn't know how Jimmy Glenn would fit into that. So I think he's fit in pretty well. Need to get some production out of him. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if if later on, you know, that's that center position on on three and four get kind of jumbled up just to see if you can drive a little bit of chemistry, um, put Chase uh, Primo on that line and see yep. what he can do. Um, but we'll see. Um, I you know I. I struggled actually two guys on our top line that I, I was really, I'm like, I really don't want to pick one. Um, but I'm going to, you know, I'm going to go with Sullivan this time. I think even though he's not on the score sheet tonight, um, his, his ability to be in the right place at the right time is, is just so impressive to me, uh, for a guy his age. And, I, we've we've talked. I think we're we're both pretty big fans of his and and the type of play that he brings, that fearless attitude. Um, he's responsible. He knows what his job is. He doesn't try to overplay his position, uh, or do more than what you know he should be doing. Uh, so I really I like him right now, and I think that he's the kind of guy that you look at and say, you know, he could be a really good asset for the Mavs for a few years here. Um, because he is just a sophomore. So yep. uh, looking forward to more from him uh, and just really appreciate his play tonight in the loss to Miami. Yeah. Or yeah. to St. Cloud, Miami. Miami's St. Cloud, last game. Miami, St. Somebody is going See, to ding. Somebody's going to ding Jason. Or... <laughs> I know. So... <laughs> Normally we're talking about a whole red. week at a time. Like, <laughs> if you're going to put them back to back, you got to give me like a black and yellow team and a red and white team so that I can keep the two t- apart. 
Oh my gosh. Do you do you know that there was a there was a, a guy who hosted a radio show here in Omaha? I think it was on Sports 590. He was named I think it was I I believe his name was Matt Peralt. And on his final radio show, he ended up he ended up getting fired by the radio station. This was this was many years ago, early 2000s. He had suggested that UNO should change their colors because at that point in time they were wearing predominantly red. He said UNO should change their colors to something else like green and i'm just <laughs> i'm like oh god can you imagine if we had the same color scheme as north dakota right now yeah god no that'd be awful wouldn't it so that just, that's just i don't know what situation right like yeah. you can't be red because of lincoln you can't be blue because of creighton right you can't be green because of north dakota right <laughs> Like, some some weird black. yellow color. We're good. Yeah. Yeah, we are. We're basically black and gray right now. So they, they got it figured well, I mean, out. They you got can't figured... be yellow because if you get yellow and black now, they're gonna, people are going to be like, Iowa? No, you can't do yeah, that. Yeah, no, 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 no. You're absolutely right. So anyway, <laughs> I didn't mean to digress, but that, that reminded me of that. But yes, Nolan Sullivan has played really well during these first four games. And I believe you and I saw uh, Sullivan and Bremer playing on the same line at Muskegon back when right. we saw them play. And so I... That's that's something I you know, at some point here along the way, depending on how things go. I know that the coaching staff doesn't you know shake things up a lot when it comes to lines, but I'd be interested in seeing those two play on a line together, uh, for nostalgia's sake, if nothing else. So that's a great pick for player of uh, player of the game, and yeah. And I, you know, we t- the the line jumbling thing. The the interesting thing that I've seen so far through these four games in the pod has been that the wing pairings look really good to me. It, it's a question of like, is the center the right piece to that line? And like, if I was going to start messing around, that's probably where I'd start. Like, well, what if you put, you know, Primo on the first line with Randall and Sunberg and move Sullivan with Weiss and Bremer and move Glenn with Bruchette and Miller, you know, like what what yeah. would that do is there some chemistry there that we can tap into just the, because you got to remember that nchc is such a powerhouse league that yep little things like that sometimes can make the biggest difference in games you gotta have you gotta be careful with these you know these these giants in college hockey that you're playing about being too predictable you know right Right. Because again, like we said, as 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 good as UNO has looked, it's uh it's it's really been a team effort, and it's scoring by committee at this point. And so, you know, you, we don't have a you know a player like a Jordan Kawaguchi who's just going to be a powerhouse on the ice every game. And so, like you said, it would be interesting to see if you uh, if you mixed up some of those uh, uh, some of the forwards that are centering those lines and see how that uh, that came I out. I remember. Not to drag the podcast on, because Bridget's <laughs> going to get mad at me. But That's I remember, right. <laughs> I remember coaching. I was an assistant coach, and the head coach at the time was probably one of those guys that is the exact opposite of what we're talking about. In that, like, he would mess with lines like constantly, and there were yep. times where I'm like, "You just literally have to, you have to leave them together for at least a couple shifts so they can figure <laughs> this out, because they're not going to do it in one shift." But he used to play like mind games all the time. And like we go up against a team that we're, we should lose to, you know, they should be better than us. And he does crazy stuff like lines up, you know, our number one center on the left D and has our left D line up at left wing and our left wing take the draw for the opening faceoff. Just That's so crazy. the other coach yeah. stands there going, what are they doing? <laughs> Like, well, in your, what do I, what's the matchup here? And I mean, sometimes it worked and sometimes it was a disaster, but it was always interesting. Well, and you remember Dean Blaze during his years, he would do the same thing. I mean, he would just, yeah. yeah. Double shift a wing and (laughs) yeah. Yeah. And you you couldn't tell if he was, you couldn't tell if he was just mad or if he was the mad genius. I, yeah, it's, it's like you said, it's, it's one of those motivational strategies, I think as much as anything else. So yeah, I can't. I can't remember which coach it was, but there was a coach that it was a Minnesota interview. I remember from like back in the '90s, and the the interviewer had said, 
you know, what's the what's the difference between a forward and a defender for you? And he said, where they stand when the puck's dropped. Yeah. <laughs> it's like every player on our team should play every position and should be able to play any position because ultimately what it comes down to, you know who your responsibility is. And it's all about, you know, the difference between forward and defender is just where you stand when the puck's dropped. That's it. Because they're not recruiting for anything like that. And he wasn't looking at it in the sense of, you know, you're you're better at this than that person or anything like that. It's just, are you responsible and are you aware of what you need to do? Well, I mean, if you look at the way that the game is played today, you know, it's it's. You know, we, we talk a lot about, you know, the three forwards and the two defensemen out there. But the fact of the matter is you really are dealing with, you know, five forwards out there on the ice, you know. For all intents and purposes, the way the game is played today. It's different, yeah. 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 All right. So we, as we said, Wednesday, uh, 7.35 p.m. puck drop uh, here in Omaha. Omaha will be the away team with Cairo College. A pick, John. You want to take a stab at what's going to happen in this game? <laughs> well, I guess uh, since we lost now, I should get away Let me from guess. my uh, three one. Three one. <laughs> no, I am not going to do three to one. Um, golly, you know, and it's this is a tough one having not seen Colorado College at all this season. I'm going to have to say I'm going to do four to one UNO. Um, so that's, it's a it's slightly different than my three to one pick. So, <laughs> um, that, that one empty net goal is going to make the big difference there, John. Yeah. I, I think, uh, you know, we've got to be careful. We can't overlook these guys uh, and there's going to be a certain element of unpredictability. So, you know, has got to be careful about that as well. And they're dealing with, uh, fresh skaters coming in so that, uh, that could create an interesting dynamic. And I don't know what this, uh, this year's flavor of, Colorado College uh, Tiger looks like, but but we will find out. So I'm going to say UNO wins four to one. Uh, I don't know if that's that's a hope as much as it is a, a prediction, but I hope we win four to one. I would have felt a lot better if we were playing them on Tuesday and we were their first game, just because I think that there would be a little bit of that rust to kind of knock off in that game and you know, our guys would be able to capitalize. Unfortunately, without that, my concern is that the UNO team that we saw against Miami kind of comes back and, you know, we played down to our, uh, our opponent a little bit. So I'm going to say, I'm going to steal yours and say three to one Omaha wins. Okay. I really hope it's another ten to like ten to two game or something, but I'm gonna say three to one because I just have a feeling like we will not be as sharp with that mindset of it's Kara College, we should win this again. And well, I'm gonna be oh, I'm mean, gonna I'm gonna be interested to see if Colorado College in their first game puts up, you know, eight or nine goals on Western Michigan, since that seems to be the theme for that that uh that poor team the last uh the last couple games, we uh, we put ten on them. North Dakota put eight on them, so uh, that'll that'll actually be kind of an interesting matchup between those two teams to sort of see where things are at. So, so it'll be exciting to see. But I and we again, know how John's spending his lunch on Tuesday. That's right. That's that's the uh, that's the early early game. I enjoyed watching three games today, so that's what I will be doing on uh, on Tuesday. So. Well, until then, until then, be sure to follow Matt Puck for our our daily podcast postings. Cause <laughs> <laughs> I know I feel like I'm I'm rushed. I'm like getting behind. So, uh, yeah. So be sure to follow Matt Puck on uh, Facebook, on Twitter. You can find links to uh, all of our social media outlets on MavPuck.com, as well as back episodes of this podcast. So, until Wednesday. When the Mavs face Colorado College, go Mavs. Go Mavs.